And there are times <clears throat> when I say, yay, God, let's do that. Let's preach it. That's what I want to preach. This morning is one of those times that I thought to myself, God, do you really want me to preach that? Um, because although it's kind of a funny story in the Word of God, it's also a very eye-opening, sobering story in the Word of God. And maybe you've never heard this story before. Maybe you've never heard it preached the way I'm going to preach it before. <laughs> but I pray that God will speak to our hearts because in this day and age, God needs a people who are single-mindedly focused on him and him alone. And this morning, I want to speak to you out of Jeremiah chapter 13, and I've entitled this, Jeremiah's Underwear. I know that seems strange, but bear with me. <laughs> Jeremiah's Underwear. In Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 1, this is what the scripture says. Thus the Lord said to me, go and get yourself a linen sash and put it around your waist, but do not put water in it. So I got a sash according to the word of the Lord and put it around my waist. And the word of the Lord came to me the second time, saying, take the sash that you acquired, which is around your waist, and arise, go to the Euphrates, and hide it there in a hole in the rock. So I went and hid it by the Euphrates as the Lord commanded me. Now it came to pass after many days that the Lord said to me, Arise, go to the Euphrates, and take from there the sash which I commanded you to hide there. Then I went to the Euphrates and dug. And I took the sash from the place where I had hidden it, and there was the sash, ruined. It was profitable for nothing. Then the word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Thus says the Lord, in this manner I will ruin the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. The evil people who refuse to hear my words, who follow the dictates of their own hearts and walk after other gods to serve them and worship them, shall be just like this sash, which is profitable for nothing. For as the sash clings to the waist of a man, so I have caused the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah to cling to me, says the Lord that they may become my people for renown, for praise, and for glory. But they would not hear. And I want to stop right there. There's a lot of people who think that Jeremiah was a bullfrog. But Jeremiah was an act actually a prophet that God used mightily in his day and age. And one thing I love about the relationship between Jeremiah and God is the unique, unique way that God speaks to him and reveals his word through Jeremiah because this is not the only out of the ordinary thing that God spoke to Jeremiah. And you know, some of us, God just uses straight speech to impart his wisdom to us. And then others of us, God will say, hey, go and get a pair of underwear. I want to show you something. Has God ever spoken to you in a unique or seemingly weird way about something? No? Anybody ever had God speak to you in a way that you thought, is that really God? Yes. Is that really God speaking to me? Because that seems out of the ordinary. That seems like something that doesn't seem sane. But you know what I've found? That things that don't seem sane to the logical mind 
are the exact things that God uses to bring the miraculous, to bring his word, to bring judgment. It's those kind of things. It's those kind of people that God speaks to and says, I want you to march around those walls seven times and break those pitchers and blow those trumpets and you're going to watch the walls fall. It's those kind of things where many times God does some of the greatest miracles ever. They look foolish to us. They look crazy to us. And yet God says, that's what I want you to do. Jeremiah or Yermeyahu in Hebrew was born probably around 650 BC in Anathoth, Judah. And he died circa 570 BC somewhere in Egypt. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet, probably because uh, it seemed like he weeped over the nation of Judah during his time as prophet of God because he saw the condition of God's people. Jeremiah was closely involved in the political and religious events of his day and, and in a very crucial era in the history of Judah. And it was in part his spiritual leadership and the word of God working through him that he was able to, to survive some of the disasters that came upon Jerusalem and Judea, and, and especially when the Babylonians captured them in about 586 BC. And many Judeans were exiled to Babylon. So what did Jeremiah have to do? What was the word of God to Jeremiah? There was the practical working out of the word of God because, you know, we, many times we learn by watching. We learn by seeing. There are times when I was in Sunday school or I was in class at school and uh, the teacher would be up there lecturing and speaking, but that's all the teacher would be doing is lecturing and speaking. And, you know, there were times that the Lord healed me of my insomnia. <laughs> and I slept in class and didn't learn anything. But I had other teachers, one of them, her name was Sylvia Chambliss. And Sylvia Chambliss was my Spanish teacher for three years. She had been a missionary in Spain. And so she knew not only the formal language, but she knew the street language and the vernacular in which they spoke on a regular basis. Because sometimes it's different. And she would teach us not only the language, but the whole culture. And so she had days, if it was somebody's birthday, she would teach us by throwing a hat, a sombrero on the floor, and everybody would dance around it while we sang happy birthday to the person. We simulated bullfights. There were times when she taught us the culture of, of the, the Spanish by, uh, she'd give recipes to the girls, and the girls had to cook those Spanish recipes, bring them in, and serve them to the boys, because that's the way they did it. And so we learned a lot of things by doing and by being a part of that illustration. And that's kind of what God was doing with Jeremiah here. He said, Jeremiah, I want you to go and get a, a sash, a waistband, basically underwear, if you will, that will cover the most intimate parts. And I want you to put it around your waist. And, and it wasn't just a sash. It wasn't a girdle for, for holding a sword. It, it was basically his, his underwear for the time that God told him to wear it. And God said, these underwear are going to be your object lesson for the word that I am going to speak over Judah. And I want you to wear them and I want you to wear them in public so that everybody in Judah sees you wearing them. Now think about that for a moment. Jeremiah, I want you to put these underwear on and I want you to go out in public and let everybody see you in your underwear. Because I want to teach this nation something. And I told the musicians before church, I said, you know, I thought about getting a pair of boxers and wearing them over my pants while I preach this. Because everybody seeing you in your underwear could be embarrassing, right? Let me tell you all a little story. It's not about a man named Jed. Uh, when we first, <laughs> thank you, Peggy, you got that. When we first moved here to Titusville, we had not seen a uh, space shuttle launch at night yet. And so I had been at a meeting over here at the church. And when I got home, 
Um, I was changing clothes. I was in the bedroom changing clothes. My wife had the TV on, and they were about to do the shuttle launch. And so I'm, I'm changing clothes, and they start the countdown, 10, 9, 8. And both, of, both my wife and I run outside into the parking lot here, and there's people on the condos across the street standing on the, the balcony looking, watching for the rocket, standing on the sidewalk looking for the rocket. We're standing out there watching the shuttle. It was a shuttle, not a rocket, because it like lit up the sky at night. It was just amazing. And we're standing out there watching this shuttle go up, and my wife looks down, and she's like, you realize you're out here in your underwear, right? And I'm like, yep. <laughs> Ain't nobody looking at me. They're all looking at the shuttle. <laughs> but if they would have been looking at me, I would have been embarrassed. And so for God to tell Jeremiah, I want you, here's a prophet of God, a man of God, a man after God's heart. He loved God. And God said, I want you to put this on and I want you to, to let everyone in public watch you wearing them. And this was a linen Garment. It wasn't just a sash for a sword or tools to hang on. Most of those were leather, kind of like Elijah's sash that he wore. And so it was, a, it was a linen. It was a fine, valuable material that was indicative of the priesthood. Mainly the priests wore linen because they were extremely, it was an extremely valuable material. And so in this, it's kind of symbolic of Judah, who was a priestly nation. The, the, the linen sash, the linen underwear represented Judah as the priestly nation. So in this object lesson, we, we understand a little bit of what God's trying to do. He's trying to get Judah's attention about something. Jeremiah was instructed by God, don't put it in water, meaning don't wash it. Don't wash it. God told Jeremiah, don't take it off and don't wash it. In that day, they would take off their sash at the end of the day, wash it out, let it dry overnight, and wear it again the next day so that it was clean. But God told Jeremiah, don't you take that off. You leave it on until I tell you to take it off. And I don't know how long Jeremiah had to wear this sash, but I'm telling you, it's probably uncomfortable. Because how many of you have ever worn your underwear more than one day? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> My son, my son used to always tell us when we would get on him about doing his laundry, he, don't say it. My wife is shaking her head no. Okay, I'm going to say it anyway. My son used to tell us, you can get four wearings out of a pair of underwear before you have to wash them. Wayne Weeks, why are you shaking your head? Yeah. <laughs> he said, you wear them the right way, and then you turn them around backwards. And then you turn them inside out and wear them front ways, and then you turn them inside out and wear them backwards. I'm like, that is wrong on so many levels. <laughs> that is just wrong on so many levels. But can you imagine Jeremiah? God is speaking to him and saying, I want you to wear these, and don't take them off. Let everybody see them, and don't take them off. It became dirty. It became filthy. It became maybe stinky. It became perhaps an embarrassment to wear, and maybe even caused irritation and chafing, because even though it was a, a fine linen, I mean, it, he's wearing it day and night, all the time, no relief. We don't know how long God made him wear it, but eventually God said, take it off. And God said, I want you to take it to the river Euphrates and I want you to hide it in a hole in the rock. This seems so crazy. I want you to hide it in a hole in the rock, bury it in the mud at the, in the Euphrates River. Now there's some symbolism here because remember, this, this linen garment represents Judah, the priestly nation. God says, I want you to take that garment that is soiled and dirty and stinky and I want you to hide it in a rock by the Euphrates. Now the Euphrates ran by Judah, and as it ran on down, it went by Babylon and Babylonia. And so there's symbolism there of what God was going to do and what this was all about. Babylon was an ungodly, pagan nation. They were the center for idolatry and evil. So hiding this in the river Euphrates was symbolic in, in that Babylon was going, this nation that was so great and so evil, God was going to use them to humble Judah. He was going to use them to humble Judah, his most intimate garment. 
God left it there. We don't know how long, days, weeks, months, possibly years. The scripture doesn't tell us exactly how long God left that underwear in the cleft of the rock hidden in the mud. But eventually he came back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah was listening and God said, Jeremiah, I want you to go dig that thing up. Dig up that linen garment. Dig up that priestly nation and see what they look like. So Jeremiah went and he dug it up and it was soiled and mildewed, had holes in it, torn. It was profitable for nothing, the scripture says. It was worth nothing, absolutely nothing. And when he found it, he held it up. And when he had the attention of everybody, God got a hold of him and God began to speak through him. And if you read the rest of Jeremiah 13 and into Jeremiah 14, you understand what God was saying and the judgment God was about to bring. But I want to go back to verse 9 and read through, through the end of chapter 13 of Jeremiah. When, when, when Jeremiah took the underwear out of that rock in that hole, he, he the word of God came to him and he said, in this manner, I will ruin the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. Now, this, this is relevant to us today because in June, we just came through what our world calls Pride Month. And you all know what that means. This evil People who refuse to hear my words, who follow the dictates of their own hearts and walk after other gods to serve them and worship them shall be just like this sash, which is profitable for nothing. And then he goes into this discourse about, for as the sash clings to the waist of a man, so I have caused the whole house of Israel, says God, and the whole house of Judah to cling to me. God said, I wanted them to be my most intimate garment that I wore. I wanted them to be closer to me than any other people. And it was going to be for my renown, for my praise, for my glory, that they would draw that close to me, but they would not hear. And then in chapter 14, he begins to expound upon judgment that's going to come. And we learn that eventually what's going to happen in the story about Jeremiah seems awfully strange that God would use basically a pair of underwear to speak to a nation, but God doesn't care what he has to use. If he has to use a donkey to get his word out to his people, he will use a donkey. If he wants to use a sash or underwear, he'll use a sash or underwear to get a hold of people's hearts and life. And so what, what, what I want you to see here is he's, he did this to speak to the nation of Judah. And we'll get more into that in just a minute. But what you have to understand is idolatry was a huge attraction and issue with the, with the nation of Judah in Jeremiah's day. And perhaps that's why he spent so much time weeping over them. Because they chose foreign gods over Jehovah. Because they chose other things over God Almighty. That's one of the reasons he wept over them. And, and the Holy Spirit spoke this to me. Uh, does it cause us, when we see that same thing happening in our world today, does it cause us to weep over our nation? Does it cause us to weep over the lost? Does it cause us to weep over the church even? As some have allowed those compromises and those, that idolatry and those sins to come into their lives, has it caused us as the men and women of God to weep over them? We're not called to stand in condemnation of them or judge them. We are called to weep over them and cry out to God over them and seek the face of God and plead the cause of God in their life. Amen. But we know what God had to say about idolatry, right? If you didn't, let me read a little excerpt of scripture for you from Exodus chapter 20 where God gave Moses the law. And he kicks this whole thing off by the words of God saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is heaven in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. 
For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations to those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. What we see here in this illustration is that God is about to punish Judah in a big way. And in this prophetic act, he is going to bury Judah in Babylon for 70 years in order to heal them from their attraction to idols and idolatry and things that they've put before God. Now that's tough parenting. But our Heavenly Father parents the way he wants. And it seemed to work. Because the nation of Judah that should have been clinging to the waste of God and walking in purity, she had allowed herself to be allured by the cultural norms of that day. And she had given herself over to strange gods, strange idols, strange beliefs, and things that eventually led her away from God and to her demise. Sin may be fun for a season, but I promise you, there is a price to pay. When we allow things to be in our life before God, there is a price to pay. He said, I am the Lord your God. I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. And you will have no other gods before me. Listen, church, because this is not just a message that needs to pre be preached to the world. This is a message that needs to be preached to the church. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall serve me and me alone, says God. Sometimes God has to tough parent us as well. And while the Jewish people had plenty of other problems after their Babylonian exile, it seems as though for a while they, they, they were effectively cured from idolatry. They had been immersed in the religious practices of Babylon, and the desire for such things had basically been rotted out of them by the time they spent in captivity in Babylon. God had taken that time to show them, I have buried you in Babylon. And everything that was in you that made you unprofitable and dirty, and it's rotting away from your life. And you know the cycle that Israel and Judah found herself on many times. They would love God, serve God. They'd, they'd stray away from God. They'd serve idols. They'd be taken captive. They'd eventually in captivity, whether it's Egyptian or Babylonian, they'd cry out to God. God would send a deliverer. They would be restored to God. They would serve God. They would love God. Then they would fall away from God and they would serve idols and they'd be captive. And then God, they'd cry out to God and God would deliver them. And, and it was a cyclical thing for them. Given that God doesn't change and many times people don't change, we should not be surprised when we see some of those same things happening in the body of Christ today. And we should also not be surprised when we see God parenting us in the same way. I don't know if God parents you the way he parents me, but sometimes I can hear that holy leather belt slinging through his belt loops. Sometimes I can hear him saying, go to your timeout corner. You're in timeout. Sometimes I can hear him saying no when everything inside of me wants to hear a yes. We must be careful that we do not allow idols to be set up in our lives and in our families and in our churches. We have to guard against it. Anything that put, you put first before God in your life becomes an idol, church. It becomes an idol. 
whether it's money, whether it's possessions, whether it's false beliefs, or, or, and the list could go on. We must guard against idolatry because the enemy of our soul is so subtle. And we may not carve out an image and put it in our home and bow down and worship before it. But if we're not careful, there are things, some that are already in our homes, that can become idols. Our TVs, our smartphones, our computer, our internet, our refrigerator, because sometimes our belly becomes our God. You say, oh, pastor, now you're just meddling. No, I'm just telling us the truths of God's word. And some of us spend more time on the internet or in the refrigerator than we do on our knees before God. And I understand that's a harsh word, but it's true. And when he returns, he's coming back for a church that has no other gods before her. She entertains no other gods and no other religions and no other beliefs. She serves no other idols. She only serves Jehovah. Sometimes things are blatantly sinful and can become idols in our lives. God, in his wisdom, may allow even his children to be given over entirely for a season to something that, that ha- they wrongly desire. And just like he did with Judah, he was patient and loving, hoping they would return to him. God may stop tugging on the back of a man's shirt, metaphorically speaking, as that man leans recklessly into lust or adultery or pornography or any of those things. God may even let go of that man's shirt at one point and allow that man to spend a season of entirely immersed in the soul-crushing in humanity of that sin. Is that because God doesn't care? No, it's because sometimes we're hard-headed and the only way we learn a lesson is to have it absolutely crushed out of us. God may bury that man or that woman and leave them to rot as it were and he may allow them to be crushed and feel the own, the, the, the hopelessness of their own choices and decisions before God ultimately will go and dig that man up and lift him out of the mud like Jeremiah did with that underwear. Lift him out of the mud and set him back on the rock of salvation. God may act in such a way towards men and women in order to heal them and purge them and cleanse them and sanctify his church. So that God is taking that linen sash, that linen underwear that is around his waist and he's purifying it so it does not become dirty, it does not become stinky, it does not become rotten. He is that committed to your growth and your sanctification. I want you to know that there were some times God will let go with a hold and let you pursue those things that you continuously try to pursue. And sometimes he may even take you and bury you somewhere until a season where he's going to dig you up, so to speak. And he's going to restore some things in your life. You know, as I, as I was pondering this this week, and I was thinking about Jeremiah's underwear and the whole illustration behind it, my heart and my soul began to cry out to the Holy Spirit, Lord, I don't want to be that tattered and torn garment that is sitting in a hole, in a rock, in a cleft by the river. I want to be that fine linen, sanctified, pure, clean garment that you wear around your waist to where there's a closeness and an intimacy and and my life becomes the best part of everything that you're doing in me. Church, we we have to be careful. See, God will do the hard work 
sometimes of, of giving out tough love. That's what he was doing to Judah here. Dr. James Dobson used to have a thing that he would say in parenting about tough love and the importance of using tough love. It doesn't mean you don't love them. It means there's times you have to love them in a different way for them to realize what's going on. And I prayed, oh God, open our eyes as the body of Christ. And I'm, I'm speaking to Crossroads, I'm speaking to those who are watching online, but I'm also speaking to the church at large in the body of Christ in our world. God, open our eyes to see the things that we have put as idols in our lives. Because the reality is, I, I don't see that here at Crossroads, but there are some churches where the pastor has become the idol. He has become the celebrity idol of the church. Amen. And people only attend his church because of him. And if he were to leave there today, everybody in the church would leave because he's not there. Sometimes we set up idols of music in our church where we have to have the professionality and everything has to be perfect and it has to be this, that, and the other. And, and the truth of the matter is sometimes we set so many things up as idols and God is saying, listen, I just want you to worship me in spirit and in truth. I want you to worship me in spirit and in truth. Sometimes God will put us in a place where he will just have to rot the sin right out of us. He put Judah in Babylon captivity for 70 years in order for them to get sick of the sin in their lives and to cry out to him. He had to rot that thing out of them. And he will do that today too. And my heart for us today is that we would follow Jesus with everything in us. That we would fix our eyes on the author and finisher of our faith. I ask you this morning, are there things that Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart and said, this, this has become more of a priority to you in your life than your time with Jesus? If there is, you need to take care of that. You need to deal with that in your life. If it's, your, if it's your job, if it's whatever it is, anything that's, that, that would go before you and, and stand in your life and take the throne of your life, it needs to be dealt with. Maybe the Holy Spirit deals with you about the, the, I don't know, the music you listen to or the number of hours you spend online or whatever it is. I told you before, every Sunday morning I get a little notification on my, on my technology of how much screen time I've logged that week. Sometimes it's quite humbling. And I think to myself, you know, I'm supposed to be a good steward of my time as well as my money. Am I giving God that which is due to him? Because many times, if we look at two things in our lives, we could tell what's first in our lives. We look at our calendars, we look at our checkbooks or our bank account and see where everything's going. We find out real quickly what's first in our lives. And I want to challenge you, church. I want to ask you to stand with me. I'm going to bring this in for a landing here. And if you physically are able, I want to ask you to come and stand in this altar area with me this morning. I want us to have a corporate time together here When you get here, I want you to just close your eyes for a moment and begin to pray and ask the Holy Spirit, is there anything in my life that I've allowed to be more important than my relationship with Jesus Christ? Are there things in my life that, although I don't call them idols, they have become idols because they've become so important? things you long for me to lay down surrender ask the Holy Spirit to reveal those things to you today and I want you to just begin to pray and if the Holy Spirit reveals something to you put it under the blood of Jesus put it under the blood of Jesus
Because that's the only thing that will bring true cleansing, true sanctification in your life. That's the only way to be truly pure is through the blood of Jesus. And once you have repented of that, then make the change in your life. Change it. Change it. It's not just about saying, I'm sorry about it, God. It's about changing it. Putting God back on the throne of your heart. And I want us to pray together. Corporately, as a body of believers here in Titusville and those who are watching online, I want us to commit ourselves to serving God and God alone. We don't have to bow our knees to political correctness. We don't have to serve a culture society. We're the people of God. We're the linen sash. We're the priesthood of God. Father, today we join together. body of believers to keep our eyes focused and fixed on that one who is Jesus. We surrender everything to you, Lord, because we don't want you to hide us away in a foreign land. We want to be around your waist, oh God. We want to be close to you. We want to cling to you because you are our life. And when we are removed from you and we are hidden away, the only thing we can do is rot. So I want to stay close to you, Lord. I want to stay close to you, Lord. God, I pray that for our church here at Crossroads, may there never be anything that stands up and takes priority over you. Holy Spirit, you are the master and the Lord of this house. 
You can move how you want to move. You can do what you want to do. We have an agenda and a schedule, but that is not our idol. That is not what we serve. We serve you, Holy Spirit. So move how you see fit. You are truly God above all. We love you today. We commit our hearts and our lives to serving you unashamedly. We don't care if everybody around us sees that we have put that linen sash around our waist and we're walking around in public and we're walking pure and holy. We don't care who sees it. We just want you to be glorified and lifted up. So together, this morning, right here in this house, we corporately commit ourselves to you and declare that you, Jehovah, are God of this house and God of this city. Lord, you've given us power and authority to not only deny idols, you've given us power and authority to tear them down and demolish them and destroy them in the name of Jesus. So send us forth into our homes, into our jobs, into our communities to walk in that power and anointing. Lord, we give it all to you for all the glory and praise belongs to you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior. I Jesus to be first in your life today. Amen. I know I do. I know I do. And listen, don't, don't make him break out the underwear on you, okay? <laughs> Follow him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. See, Crossroads, I believe he has a plan and a purpose for us, not just here in these four walls, but out there in our city. Amen. He has a purpose for us. Let's get our eyes off of everything else and follow him like he's that flame of fire or he's that cloud in the daytime. Let's follow him with everything in us and serve him. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can hug somebody's neck, shake somebody's hand, or hug their hand and shake their neck, whichever you want to do. God bless you.